Oh, that's a lot of people you can see, right? That's good. I have to look real quick. Sound still good in the back? Is sound still good remotely? Should check in with, okay. Not good. <clears throat> Glad to be back after a couple of weeks. Um, I had the chance to do a lot um, more uh, Dharma practice formally than I do at home. So even though at home I have at least two or three hours a day, now I had more. So, <clears throat> and that. Uh, so also uh, building a house on 14 acres um, on Discovery Bay on the ocean and Port Townsend, Washington. And that's its own kind of interesting retreat is meeting with builders and um, designers and septic people. And it's a lesson in interdependence. Those who have <laughs> built houses recently know. Bankers, <clears throat> so like that. Um, had opportunity to raise some per flags and um, see some otters and um, their eagles there also, uh, ravens, <clears throat> and um, primarily uh, when I'm not driving, I'm doing mantras. Sometimes the mantra is, don't drive so fast, don't drive so fast, but <laughs> usually doing like Tara mantra or something. Mantra practice is a big part of Vajrayana, so um, uh, we can do our Chanresi or Mani Pimi Hung or Tara or more advanced mantras um, when you're going about uh, your daily work or driving even. So uh, generally on retreats um, that involve doing um, uh, a practice around a particular um, manifestation of the Buddha, like Tara or Chenrezi or Vajrayogini or Kala Chakra, then there's um, certain commitments. You say, I'm going to do this many uh, mantras, 100,000 or 500,000, something like that. Um, so I didn't do that kind of retreat this time. I uh, mainly did um, what uh, is called uh, Lojong um, mind training, mind training retreat. Um, in this case, uh, mind training uh, refers to uh, training ourselves to um, uh, maintain and develop a bodhicitta um, uh, based on whatever the circumstances. <clears throat> bodhicitta is, um, of course, more than just love or loving kindness. It's the dedication to relieve others uh, and ourselves from, from suffering and um, harm uh, and making a pledge to develop ourselves to the fullest extent so we can be of the greatest benefit. So generally, the bodhicitta vow or the bodhisattva vow, um, which we did in a short version just in our introduction is we uh, we make a vow aspiration to become Buddha. So I saw people moving their lips. So a lot of people here, they said, oh, may I become Buddha, right? <laughs> so um, uh, and help all beings be free. Um, so uh, there are many practices to do that. But um, one of the more um, developed practices in the Vajrayana or the Tibetan tradition is called Lojong. And it um, has a number of different texts, but one of the most popular ones is uh, the seven point mind training. I decided to do basically a retreat on that because um, next month, uh, Geshe Tenge from Sarajay is coming, uh, actually, two Saturdays. 
uh, to Tarkan Lojang like that. Um, <clears throat> Lojang uh, deals with uh, the absolute nature of awareness, of course, but uh, many of the seven points deal with uh, what we call relative bodhicitta. Relative bodhicitta meaning like when we're dealing with other people and dealing with ourselves, how do we uh, keep on the path? <clears throat> it's comparatively easy to um, develop uh, or think we're developing uh, awareness while sitting on the cushion, but uh, it's, it's more difficult uh, when doing projects, when working with other people, particularly people you don't like, or people that don't like you, or even people that are trying to harm you, or maybe we're trying to harm them, you know? So uh, the Seven Point Mind Training by Geshe Chakawa, Geshe Dorje is um, one of the most uh, profound <clears throat> how to deal with adverse circumstances. <clears throat> so I'm really uh, looking forward to um, Geshe Tenge's um, uh, talks. I think they're just, uh, just Saturday afternoon, isn't that right, Petty? So, so yeah, so um, you won't be totally low joined out. <laughs> so, um, and then also in October, um, first weekend, um, my old friend uh, Geshe Gendon's coming to uh, talk about uh, chaplaincy like that. So, um, chaplaincy practice, you could call it, is, um, uh, you know, Lo, Lo Jong with a title, maybe <laughs> something like that. <laughs> so, how to uh, meet others uh, with bodhicitta, um, meet them where they are, meet ourselves where they are, how to really um, be helpful. So at this temple, um, I like to say we're training to become professional bodhisattvas, like that. <clears throat> so uh, the uh, main slogans uh, start with the what's called the four preliminaries. Um, the four preliminaries, as many of you already know, start with reflecting on uh, the fact that we have taken uh, a wonderful birth and now we have the opportunity to be of benefit to others and to liberate ourselves. So it's called precious human rebirth. <clears throat> so even though sometimes we get down on ourselves and wish that we were born somewhere else or maybe a bird or something like that, um, we're, we reflect on that now we have the opportunity to um, be a benefit to hear Dharma. And even if we're poor, even if we're sick, uh, even if we're a little nutty, um, we, we have this opportunity, so let's use it. The second is to reflect on uh, impermanence. So um, I like to say that uh, from Buddhist point of view, impermanence is meant to be inspiring not like, oh, things just fall apart. No, impermanence means also that things come together, right? So um, a lot of times we say in recovery, um, this too shall pass, right? So we think, oh, if I don't act on my addiction right now, you know, the world will fall apart, but it's not permanent, right? Craving is not permanent. Even idiocy is impermanent. Even the current, you know, idiots in the world are not permanent, right? So <laughs> it's easy to, you know, we get discouraged, like, well, this is the end, you know? So uh, it's not permanent. It means new, uh, new forms, new intelligence will arise. So impermanence is really important not to um, misunderstand because it was part of the Buddha's last words. All composite phenomena are impermanent. So it, it sounds like, um, that's a drag, but actually it, it means it's good news. Um, because in ancient India, and maybe in um, many portions of the world today, people's social situation, um, their economic situation, their political situation is uh, seen as permanent. That's generally how people um, in different cultures were kept uh, 
uh, you know, in subservience because God or Brahma or the gods or whoever said, no, you were born into this uh, craft, born into this caste, you were born a peasant, and it's permanent, it's ordained that way, it's permanent. So the Buddha was quite radical saying, no, no one is, uh, has a permanent uh, situation. In fact, the third thought that turns mind to Dharma is, is cause and effect in karma, that um, the world or activities are actually created through our own intentions and our own activities, and therefore aren't permanent. <laughs> so once again, like karma is a positive thing, Lots of, lots of times in the West New Age, we go, well, you know, something bad happens. <laughs> My roommate who was um, in college, you know, when I do something wrong, he goes, well, there's your karma for you. You know, he's giving me a hard time. Um, so it isn't always like you've experienced bad things because of your karma. Uh, we, we experience good things. So everyone in this room has, no matter what our background, no matter what our station, no matter what our age or illness or traumas, we all have good karma because we're here and we're generally um, getting along pretty well, right? So that's good karma. <laughs> we're in a beautiful spot. That's all the result of our own um, cause and effect chains that we've created. No one outside has created it, right? <clears throat> so that third thought is also you know very positive first one positive it's positive that even if we're poor even if we're sick even if we're rich we have we can hear and understand the truth second one uh things change that's good news uh third one cause and effect then uh, we can we're agents of change we have agency we have initiative <clears throat> so and then the fourth one is contemplating the defects of samsara sounds very scholastic but it's reflecting on if we're live, leading a life of unconsciousness then um or you know conflicted emotions then we're, we're going to have a hard life and um the idea of meditation on samsara is also positive that we we can overcome our addictions, we can overcome our stupidity. So it's a very positive state. <clears throat> it's fairly easy these days to feel kind of negative, you know? So I think, okay, global warming and war in Ukraine, Russia, who knows, you know, high interest rates, <laughs> thinking about that because of building a house. Um, but uh, when we contemplate, uh, how things are uh, difficult, then the idea is then we contemplate uh, that uh, actually there are people that are awake. There are Buddhas in the world that we can be awake and that um, we can overcome our problems. It's, it's, it's not, it's implied in parentheses a little bit. So when you contemplate that things are shitty, um, we're contemplating that things are shitty when uh, we're not paying attention or being kind, but that when we do pay attention and we develop bodhicitta, we develop loving kindness, then things improve. So I don't know if it's the right medicine, but uh, I've heard that when you stop smoking um, cigarettes or maybe weed or whatever you're doing, the lungs begin to start repairing themselves in 20 minutes. Is that right? You know, where lots of times, you know, people go, well, I've been smoking for 20 years, and I go, well, why don't you just quit, you know? So it won't do any good. No, it will. So someone could say, I've been doing meth for 20 years, and I don't have my teeth. And well, you can stop, and it'll get, it'll get better. So uh, when we're contemplating um, the last contemplation that um, the addictive cycle sucks, then uh, it's meant to go, actually, we can we can get out of it. So that's kind of the, uh, and others can get out of it, and it's not hopeless. So that's kind of the, um, you know, the Dharma good news. But I know the four thoughts sometimes sound kind of um, mm, a little bit wet towel, you know what I'm saying? 
impermanence, cause and effect, then samsara, oh my gosh, I don't feel like doing anything anymore. But actually, they're, they're meant to be uh, positive. And then from, from that basis, uh, then, uh, then we develop uh, bodhicitta. We start thinking about um, uh, the life force, I call it. So I'm going to read a couple, um, give you a little, little uh, uh, oral transmission here. So. First, train in the preliminaries. <laughs> so uh, that's uh, that's the start of this seven-point mind training. First, train in the preliminaries. So when we say first, train in the preliminaries, uh, that means that even when we're starting to do um, uh, our regular practice, um, whatever we think we're doing meditation or, you know, first do the preliminaries. Like, you have to be thinking, why, why am I doing this? Why, why, you know, that's important in our tradition. We need to know why we're doing shit, don't you think? You shouldn't just be going, well, I hope I get enlightened or something. No, it's like, why, why, are, you, why are you doing it? So first train in the preliminaries. <clears throat> Uh, and this translation, which I'm very fond of, um, uh, the next uh, the next phrase is very interesting. <clears throat> Once stability is reached, teach the secret. Once st stability is reached, teach the secret. This is a commentary um, by Ga Rabjampa, who's a um, very famous um, Lama. And um, this, this whole half is just the first preliminaries, <laughs> the whole half of the book. And then once stability is reached, teach the secret. <clears throat> so what's the secret? <laughs> Has to be bodhicitta. There's no other thing. Has to be right here, right? Bodhicitta. So that's the secret. That's the amrita. That is the grail. So the rest, you know, we're talking about both relative and absolute bodhicitta, right? Has to be the secret. Usually we think of this, you know, some some really. Um, I don't know, a special little thing. <laughs> a lot of times uh, when people are thinking secret, like secret tantric thing with strange Buddha forms, but um, in the Mahayana tradition that tantra is part of, the, the secret is um, bodhicitta. <clears throat> Interesting, isn't it? So if people say, what are you doing? And you go, I'm doing a very secret practice. And they go, oh. You can, <laughs> then you can say, I, I'm developing the motivation to be awake, to benefit others and relieve myself and others from suffering. And we go, oh, that. <clears throat> so we're going to have a discussion in just a minute here. <clears throat> Mm. 
one of the main ways of um, developing uh, the secret um, <clears throat> train in the two, giving and taking alternately, these two are to be mounted on the breath. So this is the practice of uh, Tonglen, sending and taking. So um, this is also a very um, secret practice that, um, of course, uh, you know, Pema Chodron has uh, uh, made uh, very popular. People know Pema Chodron. So um, I like uh, calling Pema Chodron um, uh, Tonglen Rinpoche. <laughs> so the secret uh, is we're exchanging uh, the whole flow of energy to um, giving our uh, virtues, you know, our strengths, our ex excellencies, our merit uh, to others, uh, and willing to uh, relate and be with others suffering. That's the secret. It's incredible, right? It goes against, you know, what a normal, our normal self cherishing or survival world, isn't it? <clears throat> so the rest of the book is how to exchange self and others without, from lose Western term, without becoming a flaming codependent. Because <laughs> that's the problem. And people think, well, if I if I take you know, if I give others my energy and I relate with their dark energy, then I'll become sick or they'll run over me or I'll become, you know, a flaming codependent. So that, that the rest of the teachings is how to, uh, we say, become enlightened codependent because the Buddha said everything exists codependently, but not in the way we normally think. It all exists interdependently, but independent at the same time. So the rest of my retreat is like, okay, how can I exchange self and others without doing it from just ordinary perspective? Ordinary perspective, if, if I'm nice to people, they'll take advantage of me, or ordinary perspective is, I gotta be nice to people, I gotta help others, or they won't help me, or ordinary perspective is, I have to be helpful, or I won't get enlightened, or you know, whatever it is. Uh, uh, with absolute and relative bodhicitta, we um, you know cut through that uh, uh, misplaced sending and taking and bring about what's called dharma sending and taking. So I think we still have someone. I know we have someone still doing uh, tonglen practice. Um, Marie's our leading tonglen practice from Oklahoma. Isn't that so? Right? Thumbs up. Right? Yeah. So. Um, that's wonderful. She's continued that practice. Um, so uh, that's the secret. You know, we we say sometimes, okay, this is the real secret mantra, um, or you, uh, this is the secret. This, but um, the real secret is how to, um, you know, be available for others, how to uh, give to others. Uh, and receive from others in a balanced um, uh, middle way, we say, right? How to do that. So that was the rest of my retreat. And um, that's the rest of this book is how to train in what we call uh, absolute and, and relative bodhicitta, like that. Mm. So maybe uh, I'll stop there said enough already and happy happy if people want to have a discussion or happy if no one wants to say anything either way is okay so i'm gonna stop here for a moment there's a hand in the back meaning you've got to be on the mic <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you for your talks, Lama. Um, 
Number one, um, point of clarification um, was the concepts, was the, the term Lo Zhang, um, does that refer to what was discussed here today? Yeah, mind training, yeah. Mind training. Okay. Yeah. I wonder if in your experience teaching others, if some sort of crisis or some sort of unpleasant disruption to someone's order or their perceived order in the world is a is a great entrance point to to learn these these concepts because it I, I'm just thinking it might be like, oh, it's so immediately applicable to this chaos and how I can and look at it mm -hmm. versus I don't know. I mean it'd be great if people could come from a resting peaceful state and and just start learning it. But I guess I'm just wondering if it if there's some advantage to like, oh, I'm in crisis. Let me let me start Lojong. Thank you. Yeah, that's the fourth thought, right? So I'm in crisis. I'm in samsara. So um, yeah, now's my best opportunity. Yeah, well, it's like that. When we're when we're talking about this, you know. Um, we somehow think like maybe uh, Mahamudra or Dzogchen somewhere else, right? That doesn't have to do with Tanglan or Bodhicitta. But um, uh, when we're doing what's sometimes seen as a, um, uh, the more subtle practices, of course, all, already, um, you know, Bodhicitta is there. So if we're doing any kind of, particularly if we're doing any kind of practice, um, we would say if if refuge in bodhicitta are not there, then um, we're not doing a dharma practice. We're doing something else. See, you know. So, <clears throat> um, uh, how has your uh, engagement with your practice of lojong changed over your life? So from your beginning of Buddhist practice in young age and middle age and now your advanced age, <laughs> how, how has this changed? I'm owning it, you know, I'm, I'm telling people now. I'm 70, yeah. How, how has this changed your, your engagement with Lojong and just your experiences in understanding what it means, um, you know, someone who's actually quite young in Dharma practice and. <laughs> not in a very advanced age, but not a young age. How, what is it? Because I've practiced this a little bit, yeah. but not much. So like, how does it change over time? Um, well, definitely when um, uh, you know, I'd first encountered, I thought, well, this is, you know, really nice. But um, these aren't the real advanced teachings, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing, you know, like that. Um, so uh, maybe I've become a little less arrogant. Um, uh, and, uh, and also seeing how essential they are most of the time, um, uh, we're practicing what would be called uh, you know, relative uh, bodhicitta, right? And how important that is. So, you know, years ago, it was kind of like, I'll just stay in the absolute world, you know, that, that kind of feeling, you know, I'll just kind of stay in that kind of spacious absolute world. And then you know, that kind of naive world that where things will just kind of roll off my back or it doesn't matter, that, that kind of kind of quasi quietistic nihilistic worldview that <laughs> was very popular <laughs> with my existential friends and my own existential reading right so um you know now now hopefully i have a little bit more um appreciation for that because most of the time um we're dealing with what we you know call the relative world in other words the subject object world but the absolute world as as we know is is has to be uh, the uh, world in the middle, right? Of this inner world, the outer world, and then um, there's that's neither inner nor outer. It's the middle world. 
So I call that like the fence. <laughs> so I don't say, don't be on the fence, be the fence. So we're the boundary and the subjective world uh, doesn't disappear. The objective world doesn't disappear. What, what disappears is the confusion because in, in the middle, um, you know, there's still objective and subjective world, but we're not confused by that, right? So uh, I think I've tried to move more in the middle and the Lo Jong has been helpful for that. I like that. So um, <clears throat> most of the time when I walk out the door, I, I have to say, okay, don't get mad today. <laughs> like that. But also, you know, uh, it, it's really humbling because um, we think we've uh, attained some, um, you know, stability, and then we realize how how fragile the stability is, um, and how necessary it is to, um, you know, continue um, uh, doing uh, what what we would call as relative practices. So um, when I was uh, in Boulder, um, one of the the preeminent Dzogchen masters, Dingo Kensei Rinpoche, came to Boulder, and um, you could just hang out in those days, small group. And uh, even when he was kind of just sitting there, a lot of times he would be reading reading Dharma, you know, um, or doing mantras or something like that. <laughs> and um, uh, later, when we were around uh, the Vyadura, you know, Trungpa Rinpoche, somebody says, um, obviously, you know, um, uh, Kinsa Rinpoche is enlightened, you know, why, why is he, you know, still doing mantras and reading texts? And Trungpa Rinpoche said to the student, like, obviously you don't understand, you know, like that. So, um, it said that the uh, third Karmapa, who has done, done one of the Mahamudu texts that I enjoyed teaching from on retreat, used to do the uh, used to do uh, just a regular Kriya Yoga Tara practice, right? You know, just simple like that. So um, uh, that that's understanding the absolute and relative world correctly, you know, like that. <clears throat> <laughs> well, sorry, it's really important in our temple here to have a variety of different people from different um, settings or cultures or interests, um, and we just can't practice alone, and we should be practicing so-called out in the world, um, because if we're just around people that agree with us or share common language, so we're just doing Dharma shop talk back and forth, it's a danger, right? You, you think, you know, you don't have any uh, traction, there's no friction. So um, it's absolutely essential that um, taking the Lojong out into the world is, um, you know, being around people that um, have no idea what you're talking about, uh, have no idea who you are, um, uh, don't appreciate your help, and you know, stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> something that's that's called chaplaincy work you know <laughs> something yeah if i was around people like say thank you very much you did a great job then um well gradually our practice will go down <clears throat> yeah in america of course um teachers have to be generally nice um uh i, I am generally nice when I, except when i'm not nice um but <laughs> that that's because if a teacher is always nice to you, that's absolutely no training for the real world, right? That's that's useless, right? So if the teacher always says, Oh, you're doing a great job, keep doing that's you're so nice, you're a great Dharma practitioner, of course I would have a thousand students, right? We'd have centers <laughs> like that. I'm not saying that, that teachers that um, have large followings, um, you know, but um, generally, like, uh, 
you know, big teachers with big mandalas, like even Kensei Rinpoche, you know, could only have a small group of students, right? Like that, you know, you, you can't get to know people personally. You can't get to know thousands personally. Um, uh, you know, Trungpa Rinpoche was a wonderful teacher in many ways because even in a large group of people, he could be insulting to a large group of people all at once. And that's very difficult these days. Yeah. <laughs> so, but um, yeah, so uh, he was kind of difficult. And then, um, of course, I lived at a Zen monastery and directed a Zen center in LA for several years, in addition to doing my Vajrayana practice. And um, that was a lot of Lojong practice because uh, it was so difficult that I still say, this is not as bad as living in LA and doing, <laughs> living at Simran Zen Center, <laughs> like, like that. So he once asked him, what, what was it like training with your teacher? I've told this story before. As a tendon, he would prepare the rice. Um, and uh, nowadays they even have rice cookers. You know, you can't make a mistake, right? So uh, he was, his teacher's um, attendant for maybe 15 years. And uh, every, he would make the rice uh, and present it to his teacher. And I've told this story. What Does anybody remember what would his teacher say? Yeah, um, you didn't cook it right. Now, the first time you'd go, the first couple of times, people would go, that's cool. He's, you know, <laughs> he's just kind of, you know, kind of, you know, just kind of testing my ego a little bit. You know, so like, I got it, so okay, drop it. <laughs> But like for years, like you didn't do it right. That that's hard training. I mean, most people would rather be <laughs> being with a stick. <laughs> you know, it's like he said that was hard. Yeah, didn't do it right. Um, also, so that's like low jung training, right? So um, then. Uh, one of my teachers, Chad Goodrimshay, told this story about how he eventually got back to Eastern Tibet and, and met with one of his primary teachers, um, brought his family back, and um, uh, Chagud Khandro Jain went with him, and you know, it's a big deal returning after 30 years or whatever. And uh, his teacher was on his retreat, so at first he said, you know, um, send his attendant say, I'm sorry. I can't meet with you. I'm on retreat. <laughs> well, what do you mean? You can't meet with me. I was just like, you know. So he finally said, okay, I'll meet with you. And then he had the meeting and said hello. And then after about like 10 minutes, his teacher said, well, I've got to get back to my retreat. Um, in his book, I um, can't remember um, Chagga Rimshay's book title, but um, the new city was dumbfounded. That's Lojong teaching, right? That's not like, you know, some teaching we like is the nature of mind is pure and spacious and it, it unfolds endlessly in spontaneous presence. And we go, God, that's great. I love it. You know, right? Um, but Lojong is um, nice seeing you. Um, I, I'm going to get back and retreat now. After you've come like 30 years later and traveled for weeks and days and had to go through the Chinese authorities and well you had your 10 minutes you know that's that's incredible right really incredible and what's really incredible about Chad Gurumshe was he would say yeah I was just you know who's enlightened being from my point of view you know he would say I, I was just stunned you know so that that's really incredible so he was a great teacher I would say like we go talking with him, <laughs> had him over for dinner. I'd say, like, I'd ask Jane, does Ramshe ever get angry? <laughs> so he said, yeah, of course I get angry. Right? Slow Jong teaching. 
that's telling the truth. Yeah, you know, that's mean he's always being a jerk or acting out. But yeah, of course, of course, that's Lojong teaching. You know, just very practical, very practical. <clears throat> you know, so Chagga Rimshi didn't say, um, I'm dissolving my anger into the Dharma Datu, you know, I mean, no, just very direct. Yeah, of course I get angry. I'm working on it. You know, he said that. I said, me too, right? Get angry, I'm working on it. It's incredible, right? Zogchen master like that. So when I say Zogchen particularly, you know, Mahmoud, don't change it. Just recognize it. You don't, you don't, you don't have to like make it funny. Just, yeah, I get angry, I'm working on it. You know, might be working on a higher level than some others are working on it, but you know, yeah, get angry, working on it, blow tongue. That's why it's so powerful. You don't have to like make up, you don't have to like make up kind of like, you don't have to put a dharmic spin on it, right? You're just like, yeah, um, we still have the motivation, the bodhicitta, and we recognize that anger is primordially pure, but um, at the same time, we're working on it, right? So that's Lo Zhang. It's really powerful. Okay, so that's maybe. Oh, hi. Hello, we got a question from the Zoomies. Uh, Zoomies. Josie would like to know, it's a personal question for you, Lama. Uh, how do you experience the world in the day-to-day? -day? More specifically, do you still experience objects or only a display of light? And Josie, if you'd like to clarify on that, you can speak up. Um, yeah, yeah that's, that's about it. I'm just, I'm just curious, you know? And I think that m most, most of it was explained before asking the question, um, the, particularly the topic of anger. Um, but um, a follow-up question would be, um, um, would it be possible to extinguish the defilements once and for all? Like, is that a thing that could happen or is, is it always going to be a work in progress? So, um... The, you know, the, there are different approaches, you know, so we have to, you know, this is a long discussion, you know, we say, do we still experience objects? What that should be shorthand for, and, and uh, for, do you still ex experience objects as objectively real existing from their own side with their own cell phone characteristics, right? So uh, the, the more we practice, uh, we're not having that, you know, um, but we're, we're still going to see chairs and tables, right? So it's, it's like when <laughs> look outside my window, uh, Middleway Health, um, you know, looking at the park, right? So the earth appears flat. Okay. You know, it just makes sense before I don't know, Magellan or Galileo or anything. I mean, if you ask people, is there a flat? Of course, because it looks flat, right? So uh, we still see the flatness. We just don't make the mistake that that's actually the way it is, you see. So, um, you know, you, you have to be able to, you know, discriminate, like, that's the left-hand side of the road and that's the right-hand side of the road, or you're in deep trouble, right? So you're you're going to see be able to discriminate things, but you you don't they're not um, you're not making the additional imputation of um, they're the, they're flat like the flat Earth. You're not adding a delusion on top of that. So if you see people, if you see chair, if you see a mountain, you're not thinking okay that's permanently existing like that. So, like, you know, in California, people build their house right on the ocean or <laughs> a ravine, and then they think that must be permanently existing, and then the water comes, right? So you're still going to see the ravine, you're just not going, and you're still going to see a house, but 
the, the more Dharma practice we do, we're not going to be thinking that um, that can be a permanent situation. It's like that. So in the, so in the higher yogas like Atta Yoga, you you still you understand subject and object, but you're 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 taking the view. The view is in the middle, so the view is unbiased. You see, whereas usually we're we're biased to subject or object. But saying you're unbiased doesn't mean like I you know I'm. I'm missing out. I'm I'm thinking my thoughts are your thoughts or your thoughts are my thoughts, right? That would be that would be mixing it up, right? That would be a problem. Then you then you want to be at Sutter Center for Psychiatry, right? You know? So you when when you take uh highest yoga completion view, then of course you both subject and object are clear. So it, we're not doing Hinduism where subject and object are inherently uh, disappearing forever. In deep samadhi states, of course, uh, they're going to disappear, you know, where you know, we can say you can't, you know, find this or that subject or object. But that's, that's even different from saying you can't find inherent existence. That's, that's even a different thing. So we have to be able to say, you know, uh, you know, all the teachers I've ever met are going to say, you know, can you bring me a cup of tea? Right? You know, they're not going to say, I'm, I'm inherently one with the tea, so I don't need you to bring me a cup of tea. I've never heard that. <laughs> it's interesting. I don't know, Josie, does that help? Where are you? Yeah. It does, actually, but um, I'm more so interested in the emotional defilements. Do you think those can be extinguished forever, or will they continue to arise, even if you practice? Like, what's your experience, for example, um, in, uh, um, through the years? Have they diminished to um, up to a point that maybe anger arises very, very rarely? Or is that still an issue? Because I'm having so much trouble with... Like... Well, it's less, right? But then also, um, there's initial anger. You know, someone you know, does something really, there's that kind of flash, like, I, anger, it's like, I don't want that, right? We need mm -hmm. to have that. I don't want that, you know. Yeah. Uh, so that 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 kind of, but the the kind of anger that's a defilement is the one that gets really solid, and then you decide to you know take revenge, right? Mm -hmm. you see, so wrath, you know, when we say when the Dalai Lama said don't get angry, there are not a lot of anger words in Tibetan. You know, we've got to distinguish that from just the normal kind of that's not right. You know, from uh, you know, um, you know, real. Uh, fury or, you know, real rage or something like that, you know, you're meaning to harm and you're trying to take revenge and, and make it worse like that. That really um, helps. Don't you agree? You know, so. Maybe I could ask one more follow up, please. Um, so um, when uh, in the in the recent years, when when I try to apply the antidotes, it has almost become like um, a neurotic like as soon as uh um anger arises or maybe ill will towards someone i i apply the antidote immediately and that's causing a lot of mental distress like i'm doing a lot of mental gymnastics to manage my own mind at all times do you have any advice for this so um in some situations uh you know um we we do have to be very quick with an antidote, you know. <laughs> if if you're about to hit someone, you probably think, okay, I I need to restrict and restrain myself, right? But generally, um, we're spending a lot of time meditating, which means we're able to see, uh, you know, uh, it in a calmer place. So we're able to analyze a little bit, right? In other words, we're able to notice, oh, this is interesting. I'm really pissed off. So we we don't immediately act it out and we don't immediately have to um we have patience waiting as an antidote, but you know, the more we are able to have stability in um meditation and develop insight, then we can kind of go, wow, I, I didn't realize this affected me so much. You know, there's information there, right? There's information in the anger. 
or grief or sadness or love, you know, like, wow, um, I didn't know I was that upset about this situation. So if you apply an antidote like patience or kindness too quickly, then um, it's like smashing the dash lights, you know, in your car. It's usually, so you want, we want to develop the stability so we can uh, experience the, the range without having to believe it or act it out always, right? Those are the two main problems that we're working with in Dharma. Like, you don't have to believe everything you think, right? Yeah. Believe everything you think, there's a DSM-5 diagnosis for that. And then if you act out everything you think, there's also a diagnosis for that. Those are two big problems, right? So yeah. you can go, wow, uh, that's, I'm still really angry about this blah, blah. So, you know, um, what's that all about? So the more stability we have through our meditation and compassion for ourselves and others, then we have more space to investigate the causes and conditions that um, allow the anger to arise. Otherwise, you'll just suppress it, right? And uh, then, you know, then it'll just come back. So, yeah. I mean, at times you do want to suppress it, like, probably it's not a good idea to just be yelling out in the middle of a meeting, you fuckers or something, but <laughs> um, <laughs> we all feel like doing that, you know? But so it goes, wow, I'm really angry at this, you know, situation, but I'm going to, um, be able to, you know, speak about it later, or something like that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, good question. Um, mm -hmm. Marie, would you like to uh, ask your question? Not a question so much as uh, just an invitation. Uh, thank you for mentioning uh, the Tangwon I just would like to invite everybody uh, to just come and explore and, and maybe try something new if you haven't tried to practice before. And we talk a little Lojong too. So uh, just really want to invite everyone to, to come and uh, be with a nice group of, a small group of regulars that say all things. Yeah, good. <clears throat> So in um, Lojang, you know, and, and relative bodhicitta, it, it generally means we're not just working with our own psychology, our own stuff, but we have to work with others too, right? So a lot of times the Buddhist uh, teachings are just geared toward, um, you know, the solitary person, like you're on retreat or you're just dealing with your own stuff in the cushion, right? Uh, that's hard enough, isn't it? But um, when we actually have to uh, help people avoid harming themselves or help others, then we really need training, right? So that's why the Lojong practice is, is so important because um, when, uh, you know, even, uh, you know, Dzogchen teachers or great teachers get together, they're, um, you know, they're not always talking about, well, what's the nature of mind for you? <laughs> what's emptiness? No, they're like, when sometimes, um, when uh, Chad Gurimshe was here, you know, he was saying, you know, I'd, I'd, you know, I'd like to, you know, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? I'm trying to, you know, establish a Dharma center here, this and this, and the, you know, what do you think? What's been, you know, you're just talking very practical stuff, right? You know, how, how to, how to create a Buddha field so people can benefit, you know, um, you know, it's very, very important stuff when, um, uh, you know, Kansar Rimshe has been here, you know, we're not, you know, talking always like, what's the nature of mind or something we could, but like, well, where are you looking for land and what's the real estate values and, you know, what's the best way to do this and is this working for you? It's stuff like that. It's Lojong. Yeah. <laughs> okay. One more? No, we're done. We have, I think, one more. Doug had his hand up. Do you still have a question, Doug? 
I sort of uh, you talk how we uh, try to, to see objects not as independent from themselves. It's easier to do that than with people because objects don't talk back. <laughs> and uh, so, what is your when you see people? What do you see? <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> well, um, earlier, you know, I, on the 10 o'clock meditation, I mentioned like, you know, sound is in the middle. Because uh, we, we're scientific enough to know that um, the, the sound can't be just the bell, right? And the hitting, it also has to do with our own recognition and our own ability to hear, right? You know, it has to be interdependent. Uh, with um, visual objects, it's it's easier to imagine they're totally independent. So, uh, you know, generally, um, have to remember that with with people, we're always in some kind of relationship. You know, it, it has to be that way. We, it, it's delusional to think that there's some, you're a separate person here, and then there's a separate person here. No, the, the minute you see each other, even before talking, you already are, by necessity, have met in the middle somehow. So you have to recognize that something's, uh, you know, already been created. There's already a, a field energy that's been created. So you, you, you can't, um, really meet a total other. It's actually impossible. So that's one of the things that Dharma says, you know, it's just you can't meet a total other, you know. Um, and likewise, you can't meet a, a total subject. You know, it's like you can't meet totally left. <laughs> you can't meet totally right. You know, you're always going to need um, left and right together. You, you're Whenever you meet another sentient being, there's automatically a relationship formed um, that um, is, uh, you know, right there in the middle like that. So we're kind of stuck with each other, actually. <laughs> so that's Lojong again, like, you know, like slogan is, well, you know, we, we can make up our own Lojong slogans, you know, like, uh, you're, oh, okay, I'm, I'm stuck with these people in the elevator, you know, it's like, California, we talk about being stuck in traffic jam. I was stuck in the DMV, you know, because I inherited a car from my old friend Terry, passed away, and so I, it's in Oregon, you have to go, you know, show the will and everything, and it's nothing like standing in the DMV, is there? There's nothing like it, and then it's kind of neat, then you just end up talking to people. It's funny. You know, everyone's so different in the DMV, right? It's like total America. So you have people with just everybody, you know, so you just stand there and you're all staying there for about five hours. So you just end up talking to people and <laughs> like that, you know, you just tell, you know, they just start talking. Maybe it's because of me, but, you know, I don't know. So it's like that. Like, can't help it. Can't help it. So it's recognizing that just like you recognize, even though it appears the earth is flat, it really is round. So it appears that people are other, but they, they, they're coming from their own world. But uh, the minute you interact with them, you're creating a, a co-emergent field. So it's impossible you know, that they can be totally other. Good question, Doug. That's good. Thanks. Maybe That's great. Thanks. <laughs> Good to hear your voice. Maybe we should close here. There you go. Dedication. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the Supreme Jewel Bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow. May that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. 
In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chenrezig Tenzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo San, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroy the entire host of Maras, Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages, Lo Sangjrakpa, I make requests at your holy feet. Thank you, Eli. Thank you, IT people. Really great, fantastic. Good to see everybody again. Some people might be staying for snacks, food or lunch or something. Yeah. Some of you I'll see you later. Yeah. Okay, quick announcement. In a, in a couple of weeks, which is the uh, 17th, we'll have a, a volunteer meeting with Lamala and um, Susan Farrar for, um, they're, we're calling them Delix. And uh, it's just uh, all of it, we're coming together to learn how to be good helpers, actually. And it's going to be after service. And then um, I just wanted to mention, like, if you are able to help us, uh, help you and help others, uh, we have a donation box as you leave that really is uh, really helpful. And also, a uh, big thing is that uh, we're going to have lunch today together, and we've actually got some food, I noticed. So, <laughs> so um, please join us, and we'll get to know each other better, make new friends. Oh,